So I have a few slides, uh, and one other panelist does, and then uh, we've got the rest uh, are going to make some remarks uh, without slides. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is um, uh, talk about the uh, state, state and local roles in health policy. Uh, we're going to talk about the Texas legislature. Uh, we're going to talk about the state health and human services agencies. And we're going to talk about the uh, 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 county and local, uh, the local uh, health agencies. And uh, then we're going to talk about uh, uh, hot topics in, in all of this. And um, uh, I, I sort of understand, and, and this, is about, this is about how the sausage gets made, uh, not the sausage itself. Uh, the rest of the course, we have topics on uh, various pieces of the sausage, uh, various topics that will come up. But this is to give you a foundation uh, in policy related to understanding who makes policy, where does it get made, how does it get made. Uh, and as Steve said, you were supposed to give this talk at the fed on the federal level last time, but it got rained out or iced out. Um, uh, so we're going to do state and local today, uh, and then the, f the federal will. But we are going to say a little bit, we have to because of this relation, that state and local is very much related to federal policy. We'll say, say a little bit about uh, federal <coughs> policy making it as well. So uh, I've taught this stuff. Oh, well, we're going we're gonna to try to answer all your questions uh, about the role, how it relates to federal, how the legislature works, these agencies, how they're organized and, uh, and funded, and then, and then these hot, hot topics. I have taught this for many years, so I sort of understand it. Uh, my panelists, though, uh, not only understand this, but they actually, have, they actually try to influence it. Uh, and um, uh, we have, all of our panelists have uh, national and state and local experience working on health policy development at all these levels of government. So we're, it's really great, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot uh, as we have this discussion from them and from you. Um, we have, uh, besides myself, uh, Annalee Gulley, uh, and she's going to talk about the legislative process uh, after I finish with a little bit of a, a more of overview. Uh, Freddie, Fred, Frederick Warner, uh, and, and, and Annalee, as you see the titles of these folks, Directors of Government Relations and Policy at their various uh, institutions, uh, affiliate, mostly affiliated with the Texas Medical Center uh, uh, entity. Uh, we have Freddie from uh, Memorial Harmon, uh, Robert King Hillier from Harris Health, and uh, and Tim Shower. And we've and the way we divide this thing up is I'm going to I'm going to give some overview about the state role, state and local role in health policy. Uh, then Annalie is going to talk about the legislative process. Uh, Freddie is going to talk about state uh, agencies, uh, and King's going to start to uh, talk about local agencies, and Tim. Uh, I have no idea what Tim's going to talk about. Uh, you, uh, you never know, uh, even when you ex ask him to talk about exactly what he's going to talk about. I'd ask him to talk about hot topics in, in this area of what's going on with state and local uh, and federal uh, relations in health policy. And uh, so we'll see uh, what we end up talking about. So our format for this is uh, uh, each of us is going to make a brief presentation and then we'll, we'll allow, if we can stay on time, uh, a couple of uh, burning questions at the end of each presentation from you guys. And then we'll go to the next one. And then I'm hoping we'll get through all five of our brief presentations and discussion to have 15 minutes at the end for just opening it up to general uh, discussion before, uh, before 7 o'clock. All right. So, overview. Um, I'm going to talk about the state role and the local role. And I'm going to just do it in terms of some bullets of what the state uh, gets involved with in health policy and what local government entities get involved with in local uh, policy. 
But really what I'm talking about is this overall system of, of federalism because what the state gets involved in and what local entities get involved in is all part of, of a system that's referred to as federalism, which where we in, in, in the United States have under our US Constitution and under our various state constitutions have made a bunch of uh, choices and decisions about what the federal government will do in health, what the uh, state government will do, and, and what local governments uh, will do. And uh, this is always uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in discussion and debate and always, always changing and always fun uh, to talk about. So this division of responsibility between the different levels of government is referred to as, as federalism. And um, I'm not going to get into the history of how we got to where we are in terms of dividing up these responsibilities and programs and processes uh, and authority and power. Um, and I'm not going to get into the logic of whether or not this division makes sense or not. Uh, both of those questions are beyond my pay grade. Uh, I'm not a good enough uh, po a political scientist really uh, to, uh, to get into that in much depth. Uh, the readings, for those of you taking the course, the first reading is a very, very good overview of the federalism system that explains pretty much what I'm going to be uh, talking about in, in um, much more simplified terms. All I'm going to be talking about is just what the roles are. Okay? Not how we got here, not whether they make any sense, but just what does the state do and what does the local government do in health policy. And then, our, and then we're going to uh, uh, divide it up. All right, so let's start with the state role. Um, the first one is uh, public health emergencies and quarantines. The state of Texas can do that. And this is the public health and safety provision of states. Uh, states have the power, they have police power under the US Constitution uh, to, um, uh, in collaboration with the federal government, uh, to maintain law and order, uh, and they can cons uh, suspend normal civil rights of people uh, if they're uh, justified in terms of protecting the population uh, uh, from, uh, from infection or some other uh, uh, health threat, threat to our health. Okay, the public health and safety role. Uh, regulate health insurance. States regulate uh, health insurance plans sold within their state. All right, so um, now the, a, a big loophole in that uh, role is ERISA, E-R-I-S-A, um, which is a federal law that exempts health insurance plans that are self-insured. That is, the employer pays and administer or pays for the plan, uh, not a health insurance company. The health insurance company may administer the plan, but they pay for the plan. That comes under federal uh, law. So states have this big loophole, and that's, about, that's really the majority of health plans in Texas uh, are not regulated by the state, but uh, the other half is. So there is this complex distribution of authority for, for regulation of health insurance. State regulation ranges from very aggressive in some states uh, that um, with respect to the kinds of plans that can be sold in their state, the kind of coverage the plans have, the rates that plans can charge, uh, the payments they make to health care providers. Okay? Uh, Texas is a relatively hands-off uh, regulating state. Uh, requiring basically transparency and some limited provisions and, and service coverage, but does not get into uh, rate regulation or premium regulation or payment regulation very, 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 uh, very much. All right? Third, and this is probably the biggest thing that states do. Uh, they serve as a pass-through. This role has, the pass-through role of states has been, um, has been evolutionary as the federal role in health policy has grown in the environment, in financing medical services, and providing a variety of block grants um, 
as that has increased, states have more or less become a funnel uh, for federal uh, uh, health policy, uh, where uh, the federal government provides funding and rules and regulations for uh, a variety of activities. And then uh, the states uh, carry out those activities and receive in, in exchange uh, intergovernmental grants from the federal government to the states. Um, uh, these grants come in the form of blocks, which give the states quite a bit of flexibility, uh, versus categorical, uh, which are much more well-defined. For example, Medicaid is a categorical grant that the federal government makes to the state of Texas to run a Medicaid program in our state. That, that program must meet the federal rules uh, for, for Medicaid. Uh, states uh, receiving these funding, funding often are required to put up their own dollars, uh, state match requirements, uh, but we get a lot of flexibility in terms of choosing which federal programs, some, some of which are optional, many of which are optional, uh, that we're going to participate in. And uh, within, our, within that participation, there's usually a lot of flexibility and a lot of room for state policy in terms of eligibility rules, benefit coverage, um, et cetera. And uh, this, is the big, this is the alphabet soup of state federal programs, Medicaid, CHIP, WIC, SNAP, okay? We can go on and on, all right? But Texas has a role in all of these things, primarily as the administrator of, of uh, where we have to you know, meet accountability requirements to the federal government to receive the funds and then decide how we're going to administer them to local uh, uh, providers who provide the services. There's a lot of variation around the country in the way states organize themselves uh, to receive these federal for funds and participate in these, in these uh, programs. And to some extent, you have sort of a spectrum of some states which are highly centralized highly organic in the way they run their Medicaid program or the WIC program or a SNAP program. Or state like Texas, generally, uh, we are pretty um, decentralized and give a lot of flexibility to uh, local entities. All right. That's probably 80% of the funding or more uh, that we get in, uh, do in health policy in Texas. Uh, we get from, and I'm probably wrong on that figure, but ballpark, you got that, maybe somebody can correct me before the, uh, the <coughs> we're done here. All right, regulate food, air, and water, and I'm going to have to move on much quicker here. Regulation of food, air, and water. Uh, state performs the regulations. Um, federal, with federal and state money, and the feds set standards and targets that the state must reach in terms of air quality, water quality. And if we, don't, if we don't do our regulation in the way that achieves those targets and standards that the Fed set for us, we get into trouble and may lose our funding. All right. Next, rules and funding for local public health. Um, every state establishes its own uh, structure, rules, and, and, and funding mechanisms for local public health programs. Uh, uh, that range from, in some states, you have a state health program that runs all the public health throughout the state. All right. Whereas in Texas, you have a, a, a state health department and then you have, that is very um, decentralized and you have uh, local uh, city and county health departments that are very independent and they receive uh, funding and it's kind of like the federal and state government. The, the local health departments do things, they receive money for them, they must meet state, uh, state standards in, uh, in carrying out those public health activities. Final uh, one here, fill gaps in federal programs and services. All right, this is the public health assurance role of states. Um, I've already listed, started to list, you know, the list is getting pretty long. I'm only, I'm only on the, I've got another slide of items. But still, there are a lot of people who don't qualify for Medicaid uh, who may need maternal and child health services. And so we have a state maternal and child health program that is purely state funded. We have a state STD screening program. We have a newborn screening program. We have many programs that do not have 
federal funding behind them, and we're trying to fill the gaps in services, uh, providing services to populations that these federal programs don't, don't provide. The biggest one is mental health. Uh, our state operates state uh, uh, public uh, mental hospitals. Boy, am I getting dry. And centers for um, intellectually and physically disabled, deaf and blind, etc. cetera, uh, run by the state, policies determined by the state. And Anneli is very much involved in, in our mental health policies. All right. These, uh, I don't even have to really elaborate on these. I think they're pretty self-evident. If you remember those five or six items, the first one, and then these, this is it in terms of state. So besides all those things, state uh, public school, physical education and health education, major role for state government, uh, prison and jail health in our state prisons and county jails, public jails, uh, state road construction, traffic safety is our state department of public safety. Um, and then the big ones for those of us in the medical education field is the state is our regulator uh, and, and our major funder of medical education. Um, and the state also is our major licensure and regulator of the scope of medical practice. Okay, not the feds, comes from Austin. All right, what, that, what we are, have to do. All right, that's state. Local. Uh, King's gonna get into this, I don't have to elaborate. But what we have here at the local level is uh, the big thing we have is a public hospital system, public hospital and clinic system uh, that we pay for out of our property taxes. About 90 some odd counties in, out of the 254 counties in Texas, about 90 some odd counties have public hospitals. An additional number of cities have public hospitals. Uh, the state gives us the authority. We go to the state to get legislation to create a hospital district and, and, and tax uh, property owners to pay for uh, these uh, public uh, services. We operate local health departments. Uh, we deliver, license, and regulate our public water supply, solid waste, uh, trash, and other public utilities uh, under the rules and regulations of, of state. We have to achieve those objectives uh, and benchmarks. We manage the built environment, zoning or no zoning, all right, and uh, local traffic control. Uh, then we do, uh, although the state has school health education programs in our schools, we have our own funded from our uh, uh, property taxes that we pay to our schools, fund health services, health education programs in our public schools. And what's the last one there? Oh, we run all these programs uh, at the, at the, in our health department and our hospital district that are funded with federal and state and local dollars. And to some extent, we're doing what you know, we're, we want to do, but to a large extent, we're doing what we have to do because we're using federal funds to do them. Okay? All right. Um, so that's my overview. This is, those are, there may be another, an item or two that I've left out that's a big ticket item, but I think that's pretty much, but it's a long list, obviously. A lot of things. And you can see the federal government pervades, permeate, permeate, permeates all, many aspects of what the state and, and local government uh, does. Um, much of what the state and local government decides it is doing is decided by the Texas legislature, uh, either in terms of new things we want to do or more, most uh, frequently making changes in the things we're already doing. We're always changing things. And that require, and most of those changes require legislation. Uh, so Annalee uh, is going to uh, uh, give us a talk about uh, how the legislature works. Annalee? Understanding. Can you come up and use this? Of course. The slide should be right behind mine. Very good. <laughs> All right. Sorry about my coffee voice. And if, if you don't mind, uh, let's see. It's 
We're a little, little slow. So no questions on this. We, you can bring them up later. Let Anna League tell you about the legislature. Then we'll stop for a few questions, and then we'll go on. Okay? Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm very excited and somewhat intimidated to be here uh, with these other panelists. Um, Perhaps I am being a little too candid when I let you know that when I first started working for Mental Health America, it was my first experience working in the Texas legislature. So much of the information that I am going to review for you in the beginning um, was news to me when I put this presentation together. And I did a lot of learning on the job and it seemed very straightforward and that one thing was going to happen and then once you got a few weeks into it, you realized that um, you had no idea and very little control over what was about to happen. <laughs> so. Um, we just get started. We are a bicameral body here in Texas, and we have a 31-member Senate and a 150-member House of Representatives. Uh, the <clears throat> important thing to remember here is that the session uh, goes every other year, so we meet in odd years. And uh, that's a little different across the country depending on what type of legislature you're working in. So if you're planning to practice or to lobby in Texas or to advocate in Texas, this is the system, but make sure that you go uh, and research the rules and meeting schedules of uh, other legislative bodies. So we start on the second Tuesday in January every other year, and it's 140 days, and there is only one required action by both houses, and that is to pass a budget. So if uh, they went through the whole 140 days and only got through with passing a budget, they would actually be deemed successful. And uh, we got close to that this year. So um, the power dynamic is, is something that is really important to understand because when you go in, you know that uh, in Texas we're a very Republican state. The legislature is definitely dominated by conservatives. Um, but perhaps more importantly is the specific conservatives or specific leaders who are in place right now to uh, head both the Senate and the uh, House of Representatives. So the, spin the Senate is uh, presided over by the president of the Senate which is also the Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick. And the Speaker of the House is uh, in charge of the House of Representatives and is elected by its members. Um, we have had Joe Strauss since 2009. He's a fairly moderate uh, conservative from San Antonio. Uh, he's been a really strong leader. And his relationship with Dan Patrick and sometimes the governor has been contentious at best. But uh, everyone is definitely excited to see what is going to happen as he's not seeking re-election, and who is going to throw their hat in the ring for Speaker of the House. Uh, one that we know of is definitely going to be John Zerwas, who is very influential in health policy and is from Richmond. Um, <clears throat> in terms of previous legislative sessions, hmm, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the most important things to <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, this is more of a conversation. This is a very in the weeds conversation, but for tonight's purposes, how these power dynamics come into play. Because this legislative session, the 85th legislative session, was uh, or saw the fewest number of bills passed in the past 10 legislative sessions. So we were gridlocked this year going into the regular session. Only 18% of bills passed. So 18% of bills that were filed actually passed uh, and were signed by the governor. So if you look at the purple uh, lines, those are the 83rd, so the 2013 legislative session. The 84th legisl legislative session in uh, blue for 2015. And then the most recent legislative session, uh, the 85th legislative session in orange. And just take a moment to notice how both the number of bills even just sent to the governor's office from either the House or the Senate has steadily decreased every single session. And you'll see the number of bills in which he actually signs the bills and puts them into law has steadily decreased every single session. But we are seeing an uptick in the number of vetoes by the governor's office and the number of bills that pass without the governor's signature. So it's really important to understand the dynamics of uh, each of these bodies and who uh, is their leadership because they will have um, the most say over how a bill makes it through each chamber and if it goes through effectively and quickly and through a fairly um, uh, not contentious process or if you are gonna be teed up for one of the bigger fights that you need to prepare for. 
So um, I wanted to walk through Advocacy 101, how a bill actually becomes a law. So this is the part that sounds simple, and it sounds like it makes sense, and it sounds like you're going to be fine and good to go, but um, it's trickier than it seems. <laughs> so um, obviously the first step in passing a bill is the idea. So when you or your organization has an idea of how of a piece of legislation that you would like to advance, you need to go and start beginning to shop that idea around, meet with different legislators, meet with their legislative staff, and try to get people on board to not only support the bill, but to carry the bill or to author the bill. So your bill author is going to be your primary advocate in the legislat uh, legislature for your specific bill. And so once a bill is introduced, uh, the uh, legislature, whoever is going to author the bill, sends it to legislative council. Legislative council will write up the bill. Um, and you will definitely be asked to provide a lot of feedback. This is one of those, the more information that you can get that legislative office, the better, so that you make it as easy as possible for them to file this bill and get it to the next step, which is being referred to committee. So uh, the Speaker of the House and Dan Patrick, the Lieutenant Governor, they determine committee makeup. So it will, uh, it can be very uh, political in terms of who gets on what committee and um, what their rankings are and what their assignments are. Uh, when a bill is referred, it is also referred from the Speaker or the um, President of the Senate to uh, each of these respective committees. Most of the time, it makes sense. Every once in a while, they'll just toss you a curveball. Um, but for most of the bills at Mental Health America, we work on mental health issues, which seems like a natural fit into the public health committee on the House. Most of our bills are actually filed on behalf of the Center for School Behavioral Health, which is a school-based program that we uh, implement. So our bills end up affecting education statutes, so we're seen before the House uh, Public Education Committee, not public health. And it's just, those are the kind of little details that you have to figure out in determining your bill strategy. Because uh, if you want someone who can carry your bill, who has a good committee membership and who is a ranking member so that they can really drive that bill forward. Um, once it is referred to committee, uh, that's when kind of I start a campaign analogy. I am a campaign veteran, and so that's how I do most of my life, unfortunately. Um, but uh, <laughs> in the first phase of campaign, it's the education phase. So this is really where we are now, when you're determining what your legislative agenda is and making sure that you are educating not only advocates within your community that you want to mobilize later to help get you support for the bill, but you also want to make sure that you're having those conversations with legislative staffers and with legislators themselves about the impact of your bill and the impacts uh, or the implications of not passing that bill uh, so that you can move into the second phase of a campaign, um, which is the communication phase. So this is when you really need to drive your messaging home. You create a mini campaign for this bill and message it about why this will save taxpayers money, why this is a good investment for the government, why this is a you know, sound health policy, and start shopping it around to your members. Um, and then once it uh, finally is taken from uh, being just referred to committee, which means it's sitting there, it's kind of waiting for something to happen, um, you need to start empowering your advocate advocacy networks to reach out to their legislators and say, this bill matters to me. I want to hear this bill. I want you to hear this bill uh, in front of your committee. So that's the empowerment phase. So we have worked on different um, engagement opportunities through an advocacy task force, um, through utilizing our social media networks, employing our email distribution um, networks, and we're also looking into now um, engaging uh, a firm to help us with texting um, updates uh, with GOTV, getting candidates out door to door, talking about each of these priorities as we lead into the legislature. And that is just to get the committee to hear the bill. So then you have to prepare for your hearing. You get a hearing date. And um, hopefully, the way it was working last session was it was about uh, a week later, usually in the next committee meeting, they would vote on bills heard in the prior committee session. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's the same day, but it seemed to take a little bit longer, as did everything this year. Um, and then, so as soon as you get it voted on from committee, you have to really start that mobilization project. That is when we hosted an event called Pizza and Politics, 
where we bought everyone we could think of pizza to come in <laughs> and harass these people um, by calling all of the different members of your committee and saying, this is important to me. I want this to be voted on. It was just heard. I need you to vote yes on this. And so that's really a great opportunity to engage grassroots networks to leverage um, support for your bill out of committee. Uh, in the House, uh, if you get your bill voted favorably out of committee, uh, it can go to either the calendar committee or the local and consent calendar. And the local and consent calendar is the place you want to be. Like, just you need to get your bill to local and consent if at all possible. Um, this is something I learned quickly, and <laughs> um, but the idea behind the local and consent calendar is that it's a non-controversial piece of legislation. So it is not going to have a fight, uh, large fiscal impact. It won't have a large fiscal note. Um, the policy is amended so it's similar to another policy, and so this is just almost a statute change. Um, so you want to do everything you can because those local and consent items are voted uh, for in blocks. And so once they're out of the calendar committee, or they're placed onto the calendar committee after it's voted out of committee, that calendar committee will just go through that list and say, we think these 15 bills are great. We're going to just sign off on them. Unless you have, uh, which we'll get into in a minute, um, either uh, five signatures from uh, members in the same body to um, kill the bill and or one individual who wants to speak for two or more, or sorry, 10 or more minutes on uh, the subject on the House floor. So um, that gets into our whole bill killing process, which we saw a lot of this legislative session. Um, but uh, let's say it all goes well, you get passed maybe from the local calendar, maybe it's on the calendar committee and you just go through your normal way. Um, then you have to make it to the floor. And that's when the entire either House or Senate votes on your bill. And so that is your last like big, big push to make sure that you are calling as many advocates as possible, making sure that you're sending messaging to these networks, getting people engaged to make sure that your voices are heard, that you support this bill and want your representative to vote X. And um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But let's say the bill does make it off of the House floor or the Senate floor, that's when the entire process starts again. And um, you have to get it to the other side. So if you're in House, you have to get it sent to the Senate. Someone has to agree to author the bill. Someone has to get it referred to committee. The committee has to decide when it's going to uh, have be heard. Uh, after it is heard, they have to figure out a time when it's going to be voted on. And after that vote, it is sent to a calendar committee. The calendar committee will then um, determine whether or not it gets an up or down vote on the House floor. So um, making sure that you have both the time on the calendar to get it through both chambers and the support in both of the legislative bodies is really critical and uh, is part of developing a sound strategy for legislative uh, engagement from the get-go. Um, just a few dates. Uh, bill pre-filing begins November 12th, which is terrifying because that's in nine months. And um, but so you can, if you really have all of your uh, <laughs> T's grotted, crossed and I's dotted, um, you can fill a, uh, file a bill before the legislative session starting. If not, there is a separate period from the first day of the legislative session, which will be January 8th of 2019, to uh, the 60-day bill filing deadline, which is on March 8th. So you have you know, 60 to 90 days to get your bills filed. And I didn't know why that was important. You need to get them filed as quickly as possible because that means every other step will go more quickly. Because um, if your bill is filed early, it will hit the committee early which means it has more time to get a hearing. You have more time to engage your advocacy networks, to engage with your legislature, legislators, and really give this bill a fighting chance to get through all of the procedural hurdles that it has to cross. Um, when we, we're gonna look briefly at um, a case study. This was a bill that actually we worked on um, at Mental Health America during the previous legislative session, so 85th legislative session, and we were very uh, proud of the fact that it uh, was signed into law, so it actually made it both through both houses and uh, all of the little hurdles that it had to go through. Um, this was a bill that would have allowed for uh, postpartum depression screening at a pediatrician's office uh, to be reimbursed by Medicaid or CHIP perinatal benefits. 
So it's a first of its kind bill. It was authored by Sarah Davis. Sarah Davis, you know, Republican from Houston, she sits on the Public Health Committee in the House. The bill was referred to the Public Health Committee. Um, so she filed the bill on the 27th. It was referred to the House Committee on March 21st. So it took three weeks for her to get a bill to have a vote in her own committee. Um, and then uh, after that, we, there were a bunch of um, women's mental health bills that were actually filed the same day. They held them all in a block and didn't approve them until uh, they were finally voted out of committee almost a month later on April 25th. They were, they were not deemed uh, <laughs> non-controversial, so they definitely went onto the regular calendar and finally uh, passed through the House on May 5th. Um, it was sent over to the Senate on May 8th. Joan Huffman picked it up, who is a, another strong Republican uh, member of our Houston delegation, and she started running the traps through the Senate. And um, it had a fairly smooth, fairly quick process, um, minus like maybe in spite of the fact that it uh, almost got taken down in something that we call the Mother's Day Massacre. And um, this is, we'll talk about this in just a second, but there are a lot of different ways to kill a bill. And one of them is that local and consent calendar, one of them is the calendar committee, and really trying to figure out a divisive is issue that will make it difficult for one member of a party to vote on the bill, uh, in favor of the bill, or difficult for other members of your own party to vote against it. And so um, on the weekend, this legislative session leading into Mother's Day weekend, um, they killed, uh, House Republicans killed more than 100 bills relating to women's health on a House floor. And most of them were killed on procedural votes. So um, they really were able to run out the clock and use a procedural, procedural arguments to um, get, a, get many bills uh, killed that they did not want to see uh, come to fruition. And um, luckily, this one got in through the skin of our teeth uh, on May 8th and um, made it back over to the Senate and was able to pass both chambers. It, uh, since it was the same bill language on the House that it would have been in the Senate, there was no need for a conference committee. Uh, it was signed by the governor and it went into law September 1st. Um, and if you want a better to look in this, this is my favorite part of this because it shows how far a bill actually has to go um, to get through both houses and to become law. And so if you go to my TLO, my Texas legislature online, you can get not only a summary of the bill, the bill text, all legislative action taken on the bill, but they give you this snapshot. And so when you look, it was filed in February, had to go through all of those steps. Uh, before it was signed by the governor on June 15th. Um, so finally, how to kill a bill in 40 days or less. So uh, <laughs> it does, it all sounds pretty straightforward, easy, simple, um, until you get into the different dynamics that are in play between the two houses. So again, uh, the political dynamics currently, I mean, this is not always the case, and so make sure that you're researching it before you go into a legislative session, but um, what are the political dynamics, you know, who is in control, uh, who were the major committee chairs, how are they driving legislation, and how, is it, uh, how are they working between the two houses. This past legislative session, we saw many bills make it through the House, only to become stalled and blocked in the Senate. Uh, it was a much more controversial body, this, this legislative session, but that is not always the case. So you have to really start to think about the dynamics, the political dynamics in play before you get a bill. Uh, before you determine a bill strategy going into legislative session. Um, this article uh, I love. I had to reference it way too many times, um, but it's uh, Texas Tribune, Morgan Smith, who wrote How to Kill a Bill in 40 Days or Less. And you can look that up, and it'll give you a very, very detailed explanation of all of these tactics, but the most common ones would be to run out the clock. So for each of those milestones on a bill, you have dates that those things have to be completed by. So there is a deadline when all bills have to be voted out of committee and placed on the calendar committee. There's a deadline for when um, bills need to pass the House in order to be heard by the Senate. So you can either convince someone to help you stall, so whether it's to hold, hold that bill up in committee, um, you can try to get allies, you know, who if you're against a bill, to stall and slow down the progress. Or you can try to make powerful friends. So again, it's finding those committee chairs, 
the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, Dan Patrick, and getting them to leverage pressure on the committee chairs, the committee members, and the members on the House floor who need to vote on your bill. Um, sometimes you use persuasion where you are educating and making people aware of the bill and they want to vote for it because it's great policy. Other times, you don't want your bill to get any attention at all. And if you can just sneak it under the radar, it will be great. Um, so there, there's kind of a, depending on your bill, two different school of thoughts. Um, so again, so there's some bills that you really want people talking about and advocating for. Other bills, you just kind of want to see what happens and see how far you can push it. Um, I'm going to uh, interrupt and, and, and ask you to stop. I'm, I'm going to, and I know, you, I know you're close, <laughs> and that's why I'm asking. Um, did, this, did your bill get through? Yes. Great. All right. Uh, thank you for giving us that process for mm -hmm. that great overview of how that's great process of all of our leaders getting a chance to voice uh, and determine our health policy. Um, we're not going to have time for a question yet. I know you, I'm sorry. Uh, Frederick Warner, uh, Vice President, Memorial Hermann Health System, Government Relations. What's going to happen to this bill? It got through postpartum depression screening, referral, and treatment is now, according to the Texas legislature, a policy that Medicaid must follow to pay providers to do this. Uh, what's going to happen next? It's going to go from basically the transition from the legislative process to the rulemaking process. So, Annalee, you had a September 1 effective date. So pertinent state agencies are going to take a look at each piece of legislation that passed and they're going to begin a process of determining how to implement each piece of legislation that passed over the course of the session consistent with the legislative intent of the author and clearly the folks who have been working with the author and working with the committee members and working with staff over the course of the session have been doing such a good job of educating their author and are going to be part of the process through the rulemaking process as well to make sure that when the agency promulgates its rules for implementing the bill, they're doing so consistent with whatever the goals, the original goals of the legislation were at the beginning of the process. So is that sufficient? Which agency? Uh, doing this? You guys would, would have been within the umbrella of the Health and Human Services Commission. So you want me to talk a little bit about state agencies, just use this as a transition. Okay. Right, right. And if you can be brief, then you can actually answer some questions from the audience. All right. That sounds good. Okay. Okay. Complex subject matter, health and human services. The last couple of years was a great opportunity to take um, a subject matter that was spread across many state, standalone state agencies, and they all went through a process that is called the sunset process, which is basically the process whereby every, it's supposed to be every 12 years, the state legislature determines, they, they do a, a, what you could consider a management audit of every state agency and determine should it continue or should it not? Is it continuing to serve the purpose for which it was intended? So all the health and human services agencies went through a process of sunset review over, and I think, and Tim and King helped me out here, because I think we ended up with a delay of a couple of legislative cycles for all this, the health and human services agencies. Frankly, it wasn't a bad idea because there were a bunch of them. Think about mental health. Mental health was, was funded alone through 19 different either state agencies or, or, or components of state agencies. So in September of last year, all of the health and human services agencies were finally, the, the reorganization process that took a couple of years was finally announced. And you basically have an umbrella under the, the executive commissioner of the Health and Human Services Commission. So when you all hear, we use way too many acronyms, but HHSC, we've got an executive commissioner who's over that agency, and all of many of the main Health and Human Services policy issues roll up underneath the Health and Human Services Commission, including 
the Department of State Health Services, including a couple of the former standalone agencies like the, the, the Department of Family and Protective Services, the Department of Aging and Disabled Services, they either went away or were rolled up underneath and made into a more efficient process of basically um, overseeing all the health and human services. So think about the jurisdiction of the Health and Human Services Commission, Medicaid, long-term care, food stamps, um, aid to needy families, women's health, disabled uh, individuals, um, licensing and credentialing for all of the professions represented by the folks in this room, um, vendor drug program, anything having to do with payment for hospitals, physicians, anybody who's a healthcare provider. There are committees that will basically consider changes that the legislature may make or changes that the regulatory agencies may, may contemplate that will have an impact on reimbursement. The folks who run these agencies serve at the pleasure of the governor, okay? Technically, we have a, a weak governor, but if you think about it, if you are in state government today or say in the last three or four years, you were appointed by Rick Perry because he served for a long enough period of time to literally have appointed every person who led and every member of every board and commission of every state agency in the state. So you have the Health and Human Services Commission, the Department of State Health Services, um, DISHES, another acronym, Department of State Health Services. Think about vital statistics, uh, health data, infectious disease, monitoring and reporting, and again, licensing and regulation of providers. Um, additionally, for folks who are in, so I'm representing a hospital system, but think about um, if you have any interaction with the insurance industry, you're gonna be paying attention to the, the Texas Department of Insurance. We have a freestanding rehab hospital, so we're also paying attention to what goes on at the Workers' Compensation Commission. And then the Texas Medical Board, the Texas Nursing Board, the Dental Board, and then the credentialing entities for the, um, for counselors, for therapists, and also for the folks who, um, you know, um, if you are paying attention to the nature of your practice, if it is not currently certified or regulated in some way, and you might have a desire down the road, such as music therapists, you would at some point roll up underneath one of these agencies. So that's kind of the general overview of the agency overlay over health and human services. Um, you can go to the state, each of the state agency websites, there are very granular organizational charts that will show, you know, how it's oriented across all of state government. Um, and then you can also see basically for the currently filled positions, all the folks the governor has appointed and then the folks who have been hired to fill those uh, positions across health and human services regulatory agencies. Thank you, sir. Uh, and you, have, because you were so succinct, <laughs> we can ask you a question. And I wanna, okay. I wanna, I wanna ask the first one. Can you tell us off the top of your head uh, how much money, how much, what is the total budget for health, the health and human services activities of the state of Texas and the percentage that that represents of the entire state budget, everything that Texas does? No and yes. <laughs> um, all right. Maybe somebody let, me think, let me think about this from yeah. percentage of... Just uh, to give people an idea of how sure. big this... Uh, all right. We have, a two, we have a $215 billion biannual state budget. So think about that. Annualized, you're looking at about $107, $108 billion bucks a year. Okay? If you look at all in, and it, it, this is why it's hard to give you a, hard, a, a number. Tim actually might be able to give you a number. Um, if you look at federal funds that we derive, you look at state funds that we derive, you look at basically what we consider, if we're looking at the budget, all funds, you can, you can derive a number. I like to look at it. It makes more sense for me to think about it in the context of a pie chart and look at health and human services. We pay attention to Article 2, a little bit of Article 3, but largely Article 2, which is the health and human services article in the state budget. You're looking at 37, 38% of the pie, okay? Two things to consider. If you were to look at a pie chart today, 
and you were to go back when Tim and I were first working around the state Senate in, let's say, the 93 budget, and we looked at a pie chart from the 1993 budget, the health and human services portion of the pie would be probably 23%. It has grown more than all the other functions of state government. The funding needs for health and human services have grown more for health and human services than for all others. So, Speaker Strauss was talking about this last night at an event for Sarah Davis. Think about the fact that in 2017, when the legislature, to Annalee's comment, they only had to do one thing, they had to pass a budget. It's the first time in Texas history that health and human services spending, we got closer and closer the last couple of budget cycles, but we finally technically surpassed public education spending. But as percentage of state budget, you're looking at 37, 38 percent, 36, 37. And now it's the largest, most expensive part of the state budget, surpassing education. It is, and I would, I would, it's, it's hard. Yeah, hard, okay, 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 okay. This is the all funds versus the state. Yeah, 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 okay, so. okay, all right. Any questions, can I maybe entertain a question or two from, uh, anybody have a burning question on the legislative process or the state agencies? For Annalee or? Freddie. Thank you. This is actually going to both of you. Anneli, you talked about kind of looking at the players and looking at the power dynamics in terms of, um, you know, doing your campaign for your bill and getting it through and passed. But then the, the, um, your state agencies are, sounds like, if I'm listening correctly, they're going to be the folks who are carrying it out. So how much of kind of setting the stage when you're thinking about crafting the bill are you already starting to look at, can they actually carry it out well? And you will be brief in your answer to that question, <laughs> won't you, <Anna? laughs> You can't. Um, so it, it, it does come into play, and one of the things that I've actually seen people do quite successfully is begin to work with uh, an agency in developing the, po uh, the policy, policy? Um, <laughs> prior to the legislative session so that you already have dishes or HHSE on board with your bill and have some idea how it's going to impl be implemented before it is filed in the legislature. But the two do need to go hand in hand. That's the right answer. Freddie? So I would say think about the fact that um, the agency leadership serves at the pleasure of the governor. So whatever they might think in their individual capacities when they take, when Charles Smith takes his cap off at night, he's no longer the executive commissioner of HHSC. He may have some strong personal opinions, but when he's running all the agencies, he's doing what the governor, at the end of the day, his, his work is going to be consistent with the ideology of the governor. All right, thank you guys. All right, uh, King, <clears throat> Uh, government Relations Harris Health System. Uh, can you bring us down to or up to the level of the county yes. and city health Cer policy making? Certainly. Uh, I think the thing that's interesting about Texas is that uh, if you go in even into our Constitution, uh, the state has really delved a lot of the, the workings down to the county and the city levels, in particular the county. Uh, and that leads into uh, what are the roles and responsibilities of the county. Harris County in 1964 created a, the Harris County Hospital District, now Harris Health System, uh, which is the largest public hospital system in the state and the fourth largest in the nation. Um, stepping back, let's just go back to how all that is structured. You have the county commissioner's court, so you have four county commissioners and a county judge. Uh, it's very interesting if you talk about uh, county government, each precinct of the four precincts, four commissioners, um, the population is divided up equally amongst those four. So there's a, over a million individuals in each one of those county precincts. And then you have a countywide elected official, the county judge. The commissioner's court then under statute, under our originating statute, then appoints the board of managers of the Harris County Hospital District and uh, they approve our budget and they set our tax rate. So that's the, fun the governmental function of the county. Um, 
what you also have, uh, you could do a whole evening talking about local county government and its role in health care. Uh, just to be very brief, uh, they have the public health department, which is very much in instrumental. They are the local health authority. Uh, they deal with public health surveillance. They have uh, mosquito control, uh, it, it goes, uh, restaurant inspections, on and on and on. Uh, you have the local mental health authority, uh, Harris Center. Uh, you also have uh, the largest mental health uh, hospital or p treatment facility is the Harris County Jail. Uh, and that also has a very large health care component also. You have health care components and adult protective services, child protective services. I had the, the uh, pleasure of serving for, uh, and working for Harris County for five years, my 34-year tenure here, and I really did learn. I had no idea of how much health care components are in county government. So we too, healthcare, if you look at the overall budget, I don't have the actual percentage, but we're one of the lion's share of your Harris County tax dollar, whether it comes from the hospital district of Avalorum tax collections or the amounts of dollars that our commissioner's court very generously directs towards uh, health care service delivery. And I will say that through the leadership of, of our county judge, um, that you know he has really taken and embraced the mental health initiative in, in this community and really combining mental health with physical health which has been very needed um i will also say what i wanted to really talk about and this is how i met chuck in 19 we were talking it was either 1985 or 86 we both got here in 1984 and it we've had the hiv aids crisis uh mayor whitmire and uh, judge lindsay created the city county panel on aids and that's where we met. Mm -hmm. And it was the leadership of the mayor and the judge that since we were the epicenter, we were the number one in, the, in, in, in Texas and we were in the top 10 being affected. And we had Jeff Davis Hospital, where the, the Federal Reserve Bank is now, uh, was where the, for one of the, some of the first patients were identified. So it was the county leadership dealing with epidemics. We've seen county leadership dealing with disaster response. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being around Alicia, uh, Allison, Katrina, Rita, Ike, and Harvey. And during all those events, you, who did you see out there and who was our leader? It was the county judge and the mayor. Um, also under the auspices of the county is the Office of Emergency Management. Um, and that is the lead is uh, the county judge. So there's, the county government has a very direct role in our lives and in our service delivery systems. The other thing that we've done is whenever Tim and I got, I knew Tim in the legislature, but then whenever he came to Memorial Hermann prior to Freddie, uh, we had a situation uh, where both Ben Taub and Memorial Hermann TMC uh, were on diversion 80, 90% of the time. And through Chuck Begley's uh, research and studies, it was what were we nine times more likely to uh, have a negative outcome if we weren't or a loved one was in a traumatic situation, both Ben Taub and Herman were down. Uh, so the county, along with uh, a, a physician leader, UT Memorial Herman, started this, the beginnings of what was called Save Our ERs, but it took the, it was the joint effort of government and private industry to get out and get community leaders to solve the problems of Save Our ERs. And at that time, when Tim and I staffed that, when I was working for the county, uh, we also said, Tim and I looked at each other and said, the whole system's broken. And so at that point in time, Judge Eccles uh, got with Rob Mossbacher, at the, who was the chairman of the Greater Houston Partnership, and we created a three-year journey uh, in Houston with, with Chuck again. Chuck, and I, we've been around a lot. Um, but we did, we created, uh, from Save Our ERs, we created the Healthcare Alliance, which really began to look, what is the plan for the optimal healthcare delivery system for the Houston region? And it was not just Houston Harris County any longer, and that's where we evolved into the Houston Galveston Area Council. So once again, it gets into council, it gets into business, it gets into the healthcare providers. And the other thing that had happened is in, the Houston market, we had for years had the Greater Houston Hospital Council, and that was the one entity that was bringing at least all the hospitals together, but it didn't bring together all the doctors or whatever. And so that was really what, uh, with that, that absence, that's where we 
uh, formed a group of, there was about 35 individuals uh, from the surrounding counties and really developed a whole healthcare delivery service plan, some of which now is still, uh, I know that uh, Judge uh, Emmett is interested in regional healthcare delivery systems and that all came out of that, of that program. Uh, we've also, I think, went from that evolved and once again, they, we were asked as a, a funding partner, we being the hospital district with the 1115 waiver, um, that uh, we help coordinate a uh, eight, nine county region. Uh, and we're one of the 22 regional health regions of the 1115 waiver. Well, the good thing that came out about that is that for the first time, we really did have people sitting down and really getting down into the weeds. So we started in 2005, very health, health policy and systems driven, but then what what evolved with the state going to this 1115 waiver, we got the worker bees in the room that really were developing some magnificent systems of care that are in place today. And we're very happy that uh, all of us have been working in DC nonstop the past eight, 12 months, and we did get the a waiver renewal for an additional five years. So I will close on my remarks with saying that uh, the county governor is, your, is a, a partner in healthcare delivery and that we do serve a very vital role uh, in our communities. Uh, and with that, I will. King, thanks for being brief. Tim, s stay, stay there for just a sec, just a sec. Let me, let me, let me, let me open it. I, boy, he's anxious with the hot, hot topics. I'm, I'm, that's impressive. Uh, so anybody, well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, yes, uh, go, go ahead, you go, you start. I was gonna ask, um, maybe you could just elaborate for the folks um, what waiver um, 1115 is. 1115 waiver. Do you need, do you need this? Uh, the 1115 waiver uh, was a program that has, was bringing approximately $10 billion a year into the state from the federal government and there are two forms of pools. There's one that pays for the uncompensated care that is rendered uh, a little over $3 billion a year into the hospital systems, but there's an additional $3 billion a year statewide that are going to programs that are models of care and are paying for, for services. And for example, we've really bolstered healthcare services in the behavioral health and mental health sectors of, of, of the, uh, of our community, uh, as well as Harris Health System opened up a variety of new primary care clinics. It was a precursor of what they thought if the, the Affordable Care Act would have been fully implemented, you would have had a Medicaid expansion, which didn't happen, but that Medicaid expansion was going to be the payer of these new primary care clinics. Well, that didn't happen, but we've had the continued funding, so hopefully for the next five years, we've got this figured out that we can maintain these services. And I will say, I have never known the federal government, once they've allocated this $10 billion, that $10 billion will most likely continue, but in what way, shape, or form, I can't tell you. Um, so, but those dollars will be in the system. Let me, let me just, let me just uh, add that this is a real example of federalism because up until this waiver, Harris Health and other public and private hospitals that were serving a, a high percentage of Medicaid and low-income uninsured populations were receiving at the end of the year a supplemental payment from the federal government beyond what they were getting for, for, for Medicaid because they were, uh, you know, uh, because the Medicaid doesn't pay a, a very well and they were, they were serving people who didn't have any resources, all right? Up until this program, the sup this supplemental payment came in the form of a lump sum based upon past behavior. All right, the federal government in its wisdom decided that, uh, you know what, we're still gonna continue giving you this money, but we're only gonna give half of it on the basis of your good behavior, and the other half you're gonna have to earn by doing these disparate projects because we want you to reform your healthcare systems. We want you to get, try to get stuff going that keeps people out of the hospital, keeps people out of, even out of clinics and doing some preventive care and, and doing things like that. So, that's, so we, we reacted because they put a bunch of money on the table that we could not refuse and we are trying to change uh, and improve our delivery systems. All right, King, thank you very much. We may have some more time for state and local stuff, but 
You know, um, Tim, uh, senior VP, Cornerstone. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Get, you can get up and, and walk over here slowly. Uh, Cornerstone Government Affairs and the lobbyist for, or, uh, of, for one of our uh, Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicaid managed care organizations, Community Health Choice, which is affiliated with Harris Health System. Um, Tim, it, it sounds like everything's going smoothly with state and local policy. Are, are there some issues? Issues? For us are there to some hot topics? You know, um, just to give you a really kind of a little funny history, that, and I'll build on what King said. In 1992, my very first job in the Texas state government was the Texas Health Policy Task Force. And it was appointed by the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker. And we were going to go around the state, and we we're going to have these hearings, and we we're going to listen to everybody, and we were going to talk about the issues, and we were going to write a document that was going to solve all the problems. Now, I just changed offices about 18 months ago, and I found a copy of the report that we wrote. How many of those issues do you think are exactly the same today, just bigger, because we got almost twice as many people now as we had back then? Pretty much all but one. I was so psyched that I could actually say there's one of those issues that we really wrote a whole chapter about at that time that's no longer an issue. Anybody guess what issue that we had in 1992 that we in Texas were talking about a, a, a crisis that nobody really talks about in Texas anymore? Anybody? Doctors? I'll give you a hint. It's a doctor issue. Doctor issue. Thank you. Ding, 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 ding. Give him a prize. There we go. Yes, the issue in 1992, um, amongst, yeah, well, I'll tell you, in 2003, we passed a constitutional amendment. We put some caps on some things, and quite frankly, we ran off almost all the lawyers that sued doctors. Now, if you, hear, if you talk to some folks, they'll tell you that it still happens occasionally. I can tell you the insurance costs for MedMal are almost nothing. Um, the number of suits for the hospital systems have gone to almost nothing. As a matter of fact, I pray for you if you ever do get hurt or damaged at the hands of a doctor or a hospital. I probably shouldn't say this in this room, but you're kind of screwed. Um, you have no recourse in Texas. You're welcome. We fixed that one. Might have gone a little too far. Um, but that's policy. Sometimes you do. You take a swing at something, and sometimes you go too far. But of all the other issues that we talked about in 1992, access to care, funding, um, you know, the, the, the issues of prevention, all those things were really big. But um, if I can shift a little bit, I can talk about the hot topics that I care about. But I'm looking around the room, and you guys probably want to talk about the issues that you care about. And let me throw it in. First of all, I want to ask, and this is kind of the choose your own adventure by raising your hands. Do we want to talk about health policy and the way the World Health Organization talks about it, kind of a health in all policies and some hot topics there? Or do we want to talk about health care policy? So those of you in favor of, and health care policy is really limited to the delivery of care to when people are sick or hurt, right? That's, in my mind, health care policy. It's very targeted. It impacts, it, it, it impacts the people that are up here that have talked about some issues. But there are some bigger issues the way we look at it. So if you want to just talk health care policy, raise your hand. OK, if you want to talk health policy, raise your hand. All right, health policy is winning, although neither one is really all that enthusiastic. <laughs> I know you all are tired. Um, it's getting late, so I'll try to, try to keep it going. So I'm going to say a little bit on health policy. You know, the, the World Health Organization has been talking quite a bit uh, about how do you define this crazy thing. And, and when they talk about health, they literally is about where lives you're born, where you grow, where you live, where you work, where you age. OK, so that's pretty much everything. Um, absolutely everything. And they, they've got sectors. They've got a division. They've got it divided up. And there's, there's all sorts of really technical things. Now, is that a hot topic? Did anybody hear about that in the news? Probably not, right? Because it's just really wonky. And those of us that love policy wonk stuff, it's really important and it's fascinating. And we've made a lot of strides over the years. But for the most part, you're not going to see it on CNN because it's not a plane crash. And plane crashes are much more interesting, right? I mean, the things that they put on, the hot topics. So let's talk a little bit about what are hot topics as it relates to health policy. What is in the news right now? What caused the federal government to shut down last week? And this is a big issue in Texas. Immigration, thank you, ding, 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 prize back there. Yes, it's immigration. The United States has had a horrible immigration policy for, let's see, its entire existence, okay? 
I mean, if you go back to John Adams, the one thing that most people remember is his Alien and Sedition Act. Why? Because they didn't like the immigrants back then either. Oh my gosh, the immigrants are taking all the, the, the jobs. Well, we've got a lot of jobs. We need a lot of people. Who are you going to fill them with? We're not birthing enough, so we probably ought to bring some people in. And we've never made it easy to get into this country. It's screwy and it's a mess. And we've been talking about fixing it about every other decade for 200 years. So what makes them think that we're just going to solve it over the weekend because we had a shutdown? I don't know. But that's a kind of hot topic that's going on. Now, how does that impact health care? Do immigrants here in Houston get sick and hurt? That's what we say all the time. Oh, they, they do. How many states have disproportionately high percentages of undocumented? Of undocumented. How about cities? There aren't too many cities like Houston that have such a high proportion of people who are here and, quite frankly, are kind of living in the shadows because they don't have papers. Now, the irony of it is most of them, if you study the issue, they didn't come across the border. They didn't crawl over some wall. They came here on student visas and tourist visas, and they came on legal visas, and they said, hey, I got a job here, and it pays pretty well, and I can send money home. I'm staying. And we really don't check a whole lot. So, yep, there's lots of jobs, and the people who employ them enjoy the low-wage workers, and so we're going to keep going. Now, we could get into a really fun discussion on immigration, but how does that impact our health? Are they getting immunized? Nope. Are they part of prim primary care? Are they getting things checked or do they wait until it's an absolute worst case scenario and they show up in the emergency room? Could we get better policy as it relates to immigrants? Absolutely. Is it the number one issue we're talking about right now? No, but we're mad about the immigrants. By God, we're going to build a wall. If we want to find and have a good conversation, the people in health care have to start driving those issues. I'll tell, most people don't know, who do you think got the, uh, the, the seatbelt laws changed in Texas? Was it the car manufacturers? Was it the consumer advocates? Consumers Union, they're great people, I love them. Did they get it changed? Uh-uh, it's people like you in this room. Doctors and nurses who, stop, who got really tired of seeing people completely mangled when they came out of a car that had been in an accident. And they said, you know, we ought to do something about this. Who do you think got the helmet law changed? Unfortunately, it got undone because doctors got busy doing other things. Doctors. The helmet law that was passed in the early 90s, it was doctors, and it was nurses, and it was people who cared about things. The drunk driving laws. Yes, MAD cared about it, but as soon as the doctors got involved and the nurses got involved, things changed. Policy is something that is something that we should own in this country, that when you see something that's broken, you decide to fix it. So what issue should... Do you, or let me just say, what issue do you, other related at the state level is kind of a hot topic right now? Related to health, yeah? Exactly. Why? Because statistics are scary. Statistics are scary, but why? Because people die. Individuals die. Moms are dying. Real people are dying. Friends of Real people are dying. This is not just a number. This is a very human issue. And our governments are designed, and they're supposed to be there, to help us solve problems. Now, granted, if you listen to some of the news media, you're not sure what our government does. And, and sometimes when you think about 140 days and how you kill a bill and all this kind of stuff, which is technically very interesting and accurate, the most important thing is, is what is our government doing about our communities, right? And what does health policy mean about each of us? Let me, let me throw a policy discussion issue out that has been so frustrating for me in the last couple of years. When it comes to health insurance and how we pay for care, and this is a big health policy issue, are you on your own or are you part of a community? It's a basic fundamental question. Raise your hand if you think you're on your own. There's a couple people. Raise your hand if you think you're in a community. More people there. Well, I can promise you, no matter how much you stick away in an HSA, a health savings account, if you really do have a major episode, whether you plan on it or not, you can't afford it. Maybe 1% of our population can actually afford a major health incident, right? Um, we all rely on each other. That's called insurance. It's risk management, how we share the risk for what may or may not happen. Now, we all pay into health insurance, whether you know you are or not. And that's a huge issue. How do we cover each other? And, and uh, uh, Dr. Garson, when they were doing the uh, myths last week, and, or two weeks ago prior to the whole freeze thing, um, they were talking about what is the responsibility we have. Those are some of the big important policy issues. Now, why do I think that's important, particularly at the state level? Because there's a rump group in the legislature right now that is pretty much hardcore libertarian that thinks that insurance is part of the nanny state. 
And you ought to just go back to, if you can afford it, you get health care. And if you can't, tough luck, you're dying under a bridge. You're on your own. Now, that might sound a little harsh. Somebody might spin that a little differently. I am a lobbyist, after all I know. It's the only profession that ranks below trial lawyers in public opinion <laughs> polls. I'm OK with that. It's who I am, OK? But those are the facts. What do we have as a community when we start talking about health policy that impacts our lives and your life? How does it impact you? I mean, your family, do you want to be all on your own? You say, okay, I'm going to take all this risk on my own. I'm going to try to put a little money over here. Or do you think, you know what, maybe we ought to have some sort of insurance. We ought to have some shared risk. We ought to share things so that if my neighbor actually does get cancer or, or some other issue, that there's a funding mechanism to take care of them so they can get care because maybe one of the days I might need it. And chances are, the older you get, the more you may need it, right? So these are some really hot topics that go on. There's some other issues um, that have been in the news quite a bit. Uh, I would say, let me give you a hint, since Sandy Hook, what other issues? Interesting, you said guns, but in Texas, we don't talk about guns, we talk about the need for mental health services. Because it's not guns that kill people, it's crazy people with guns that kill people. So if you reduce the number of crazy people in the state, I'm quoting, by the way, this is not my personal opinion, I'm quoting the legislators, if you, you, they, they feel much more comfortable talking about mental health. And, oh gosh, we need to do more about mental health. You know what? If that's the reason, we can write it, right? If, uh, it, 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 it's sick and kind of weird, but okay, if they think mental health is the important way to reduce guns in schools, let's do it. Let's solve some mental health problems. But that's what all of a sudden changed the tide in Texas. Sometimes hot topics don't happen the way you plan them. Sometimes they just get dropped in your lap. King was talking about trauma. We didn't plan for that one. I promise you nobody would have planned for that one. It just happened, and we started realizing there were some doctors that said, what happens to all these people? If we go on diversion, where do they go? And it turns out they get stuck in some of the outlying hospitals, and God bless them, they're doing the best they can in some of those outlying hospitals. But if you've been in a major traumatic event, it turns out you don't want to be in one of those outlying hostels, hospitals. If you can gurgle out Ben Taub or Herman, say it. The hospitals will get you there. <laughs> right? Even to this day, that's true. I tell all my friends that, by the way. You or your loved ones, if you can say either one of those hospitals, they'll get you to the right place, and they will save you if there's a chance. If you got a sniffles, you know, you got a or snake bite, I went through that, I won't tell you that story, but it's okay to go to the outlying hospital. Phone works pretty well. Uh, other questions, what other is issues are, are kind of hot burning issues that you think are kind of going on right now? What's causing the, 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 the Me Too movement? Sexual assault. Sexual assault, right? Interesting, I haven't heard too much about it in healthcare. I look around this room, there's a lot of women in this room. Is healthcare immune to it? Oh, of course not. I worked at a hospital for three years when I got out of the whole policy and advocacy thing. I was working at a hospital and I thought that's what I wanted to do. Oh my goodness, some of the most inappropriate discussions I've ever heard, even more so than at the Capitol, happen around the operating room. How many weeks and months is it before somebody starts saying, why is this going on? Why is this acceptable for doctors to be harassing the hell out of nurses? I don't know. That might be a hot topic. Might not. Might just skip right over. Might just stay in kind of Hollywood and Congress, it is, and the legislature. But those are the hot issues. Um, other hot issues, something happened in uh, the end of August, September, kind of created a hot issue in our community. A disaster recovery, exactly. What, what, what's important as it relates to health policy when you recover? Money. Former Lieutenant Governor uh, Bill Hobby used to give, build, uh, build a, a health policy class, and he would tell you that all policy is about three things. <clears throat> and he always cleared his voice. He would go, it's about uh, <clears throat> money, <clears throat> money, and money, and everything else is uh, poetry. And it is. How do we get money to the people who need it? How do, we get people to, how do we get money to the counties? Interestingly enough, when Freddie was talking about the money from 1992 to now, it almost implies that we're doing the same thing. I can promise you we're not. The number of lives that we cover now, Medicaid hardly covered anybody in 1992. We cover almost all the kids now. Not all, but pretty close to it. Most, most of our kids are in families that are under 200% of the federal poverty level, which includes CHIP and Medicaid. Okay, that's a lot of kids, and those are a lot of lives that are covered. That's a lot more than it was in 92. Uh, we do a lot more now at the state health policy level, particularly as it relates to money, than we ever did. 
We've got a lot more challenges going on as well. Again, when you've got 13 million people in a state, you've only got half the problems. That, what, what are we here today, 28 million people in the state of, state of Texas? Which means we're going to get new congressional seats. Yay, except for they're going to reapportionment. Ugh. You never know exactly how the districting <laughs> thing's going to go. Right, a little gerrymandering here and there. We'll kind of do a little. All right, let's open so up. questions, yeah. let's jump open in. Let's this up now. Uh, any questions you have of Tim or anybody else on the panel? And what is there? Do we have to do a microphone, or how do we? How are we doing this, Adele? Uh, I want to see him throw I the ball. I saw somebody in the back there who was a, a, had a question. Did you want to ask your question to start it? Yeah. The opioid crisis. The opioid crisis. Great question. And uh, there's there's quite a bit of attention in other states where they've seen a lot more deaths. I'm going to jump to Texas, but. Fortunately, it hasn't quite made it all the way here yet, uh, particularly as it relates to New Hampshire, but I'm going to throw it over to King because we are definitely seeing um, an increase in the number. Yeah, we, uh, we have just concluded a study that's going to be uh, sent down to the county attorney's office who has filed uh, on a, a lawsuit on the opioid issue. Uh, we are not like West Virginia. We are not what you're seeing on the news right now, but I will tell you we're starting to see an uptick coming through our systems. Um, it's still, it's a, it's a manageable issue, but it's something that could really grow uh, if we, if law enforcement and the community doesn't get their arms around this, because we're the back end, and there's going to be a lot of unnecessary death. Could you also, if we have questions on the structure and process of state government, as well as the specific topics of health policy would be, uh, anybody have anything, any questions about what, that's what we talked about in terms of legislative process or the state agencies or why we have two health departments and all that kind of structural stuff and why, why is it that the federal government doesn't do Medicaid alone rather than the state federal, you know. You, have, you had a question. Somewhat related to that. Okay. Given that dollars per person and like you said that it requires nurses and doctors to get health care policy done and it seems like the major policy piece referenced was protecting the health care system are we ever going to see health care policy that chips away at that cost per person because obviously the people are most effective at getting policy done will be most harmed right right and, and wouldn't it be really powerful if that came out of this community of healthcare providers, that, we, that concern for cost? Because we're, all, we're real, all real good at identifying unmet needs and going to the legislature and asking for additional funding to meet those needs. Um, how, good, how often have we gone to the legislature and said, uh, we have a way of saving money? There was somebody else, and then, and then you can... Yeah, back there you had a question. Oh, 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 sorry. Okay, okay. No, okay. So we have we have another another response the, from. So I, I I have an illustration that I use to address your question. And I always think about so you think about federal and state reimbursement rates, and that's a trend line, and it's never going to stabilize. It's never going to go back up. So to your question. Everybody in this room who works for a physician's group, a hospital, everyone is keenly aware that going forward, we're not going to get any increase in reimbursement. So if you can't figure out a way to not just take your costs where you can out of your system, but get out of the old kind of fee-for-service model and move forward into actually being paid exclusively on a quality metric and being paid for your quality, being paid for your performance, that's got to happen. Because we would all agree that the current, not just the healthcare delivery system, but the way in which it is reimbursed is absolutely not sustainable going forward. How, we, how quickly we get there, I can't tell you, I just know that we're all terrified. If you look at this uh, all the organizations within the Texas Medical Center, Dr. Garson, how many times ha within the last year have you had the unpleasant circumstances of having to report on, it's Memorial Hermann, it's MD Anderson, it's CHI St. Luke's. We're, we're laying people off, we're taking 
terrific amounts of cost out of our systems just in this area. Look across the country. It's the same thing. Mayo's taken a billion dollars out of their system. Not sustainable going forward. We are so far stuck in the old model and moving at snail's pace to get out and get into the model we've got to get at to get control of costs. I'd like to take a shot at that. that if you we've look got at two the, more minutes. Okay, Tim. at the, the international data and the areas where you've got communities spending less than us, they're spending a lot more on their public health systems. They're making sure that some of those prevention things are happening. There's a lot we could actually do to reduce the demand for health care services, which reduces that cost number. But that's going to take a whole lot of people embracing that kind of stuff. And I can tell you that in a room like this, when we're not near the legislature, when we're not near Congress, a lot of people shake their head and say, yeah, that's right. Let's go work on that. But, but and I've worked on, a, on, on the, the childhood obesity issue, when it comes time to using political capital to go in and talk to their legislators, you want to know, and, and I'm not indicting any doctor in this room, but I'll tell you that the Medical Association used to use their political capital on public health issues like helmet laws, like seatbelt laws. The number one issue that they've used for the last 15 to 20 years has strictly been reimbursement, reimbursement, reimbursement. They have almost stopped talking about tobacco. They've stopped talking about obesity. They've stopped talking about a lot of those things. So I challenge you, there's a good group called Doctors for Change. I love them to death. They're great people. I've been working with them. They're fighting their doctors that are trying to change this and say, yes, we care about people that are sick and hurt, but if we can get ahead of this and start working on some of the public health issues, we can, we can start returning that cost trend. Because if, if, if you look at the health status of where we are in this country, it's pretty scary. And, and uh, I, I heard a story on the radio yesterday that for the first time, we've actually seen a, a, a decrease in our life expectancy, which interestingly enough might save us some money, but I don't think that's a really good policy. Um, I know that sounds sick, but, but, uh, but, but that's, those are some of the big issues that I think if you really want to talk about health policy and trying to bend the cost curve, like, like Freddie talked about, we're going to have to change the mechanisms of payment. Um, we're going to have to change some of the incentives, but we're going to have to engage in some of these public health issues. We weren't meant to be sitting here looking at screens all day and not playing and not getting our kids outside. Now I'm getting real preachy, sorry. This is something I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, I grew up running around all the time outside and the only time I came in was when it was dark. Um, now kids are like, their parents text them and tell them when to come in. And you're like, if, if they were out at all. And you're like, wait a minute. So, you, so they're outside, but they're still playing on their screens? This makes no sense. So I'm off my, my high horse, hey, sorry. you get the last word. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and for your interest in health policy. See you next week.